Hi, everybody. Welcome to the new episode of Common Ground, and we're bringing on our new guest, Libertarian presidential candidate Mike Termont. And we're going to talk about his background, his politics, and I know you all are going to love this episode. Thank you so much for coming, Mike. Oh, my goodness. Thanks for having me on. It's a joy to be with you guys. Thanks for uh, setting it up and giving me some of your minutes. Sure thing. What what brought you into politics, Mike? What do you want the goal of the political um, positions you follow? Uh, I appreciate it. There's There's a lot there to unpack and just a few words of a question, aren't there? Uh, I suppose I came to politics for some of the same reasons that a lot of people do, uh, frustration with the way the system is going currently. If if you think that the government is going in a good direction and and therefore the United States is going in a good direction, I, I think we need to talk. Um, no I, I grew up that. as <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I grew up as a Republican of sorts, uh, fiscally conservative. I was in the banking industry for a while coming out of business school. Uh, went back to graduate school at the GW University and then went to work for a couple international agencies and the federal government and worked for the White House for a couple of years and did some other things, had my own business and worked as a free market advocate in Washington for the financial services businesses for a long while. And as a second career, became a police officer in South Broward County in, in Florida. And I would say that I became a libertarian around the time I became a police officer. I became a registered libertarian, which is to say around 2010 or 2011, at which point, uh, having come to libertarianism from the from the right hand side, which I would characterize as a recognition that the world works better when you let people make decisions for themselves, having been a Republican and a fiscal conservative, that was a, a fairly easy leapfrog. Yeah. Uh, but in, in around 2010, I, I decided to become a, a registered libertarian, uh, arguably having been a libertarian of sorts for a couple of uh, decades before then, in a recognition that I had come to libertarianism also from, from what I would call the left-hand side, which is to say that even if it were not true that the world were made better off and the economy worked more efficiently when people make decisions for themselves, the government still doesn't have the authority, morally, yeah. ethically speaking, to make decisions for you, that we all have the right to live our lives by our own standards and and make our own mistakes and make decisions for ourselves and for our families. And, and, and so uh, I've been a, a registered libertarian for only about a dozen years, but a de facto libertarian for a long, long time. I'm sure a lot of uh, people would say the same thing. Yes. I uh, completely understand that. And I think we're in roughly similar political positions. And my biggest problem with the modern Republican Party and the right is moralizing, where it just modern conservatives will try to push what I honestly think are often outdated values on the population. And then it comes across as people my age group say very cringe. And um, the cringe is kind of because it's out of touch. But also, I understand the libertarian leaning because my background's in history, and you've never given the state power in history and had it not abuse it. And if you want to look across the history of the world, the norm is that it's a it's a, an emperor who basically puts himself in power and then rules how he wants over the population. And I think it's very special that we don't have that, but we don't really have any conception of how rare it is. I think you're exactly right, and that's a very astute observation. I don't think Americans do have a recognition either for how rare it is or how easily uh, certain aspects of our democracy can slip away from us. Yeah, I would argue that where, you know, uh, maybe uh, as recently as a couple of decades ago, we used to make fun of the idea of authoritarians rising to power around the world. And we would say things like, you know, that could never happen here, right? That could never happen in America. And I think that more Americans than ever before are waking up to the idea that authoritarianism can grow out of democracy. It, it does around the world regularly. And it is typically the result of politicians telling you that what you have to fear is not so much the, the loss of your civil liberties or a distant attenuation to your constitution, but what you really have to fear is that other idiot coming to power. Yeah. And we see a lot these days of the Republican and the Democratic Party staking out as their number one objective, keeping the other 
party from coming to power. We, uh, maybe you would agree with that. And they have, in effect, left behind the agenda that they used to pursue. And yeah, I think this is where authoritarianism comes from in a democracy and is therefore growing in the United States. I uh, study the cycles of history, and one of the biggest cycles is one that compares the Roman Republic to the modern American Republic. And the fall of the Roman Republics, I see a lot of parallels with it in America today, where I don't know how much um, you've studied this, but what happened in Rome is they were of, they had a strong middle class. They were a society with a lot of values that cared deeply about their freedoms. They became a global empire, became ludicrously wealthy. That destroyed their equality. And so you had people living off the state with welfare. As the society became so wealthy, people stopped seeing the need to have any values. And then over time, these military strong men would offer the public more and more goodies to basically follow them until the entire republic became people bribing parts of the population to support them. But then like our system as the legislature stopped doing anything, what happened was that in the same way that for us, we try to govern through the executive and the Supreme Court against the legislature is that authoritarianism grew more and more until Rome became a military dictatorship. And the America we look at today 80% of the population approves of the military, 20% approves of Congress. And so as we, exactly as you said, as we get into a society where there's so little, our trust in democratic institutions fails and we stop and we view the government as a way of getting things rather than something we give for our own freedom. I, I also worry about the fall of our liberties going away. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, and I think that you um, mentioned a couple of things that that I want to agree with. Uh, you packed a lot in there again. Um, you know, one is this idea that we expect things from our government. Yeah. I would argue that one of the most pernicious ideas in the history of mankind and possibly the most pernicious uh, when you take into consideration its its uh, broad spectrum effects are the ideas included around you know this notion that wealth is a zero sum game that we get ahead by taking from somebody else or that we uh develop our wealth or income at the expense of someone else's yeah you know this is an old uh tribalistic notion that I have no doubt has uh, anthropological origins that maybe served our ancestors well in, uh, you know, before the dawn of recorded history. Uh, I I don't need to go there, but certainly it's what gave rise to the notion that uh, governments uh, were rationally Mm -hmm. motivated to take things from people and be in the business of distributing things to people in order to maintain their power. Uh, you also talked about <clears throat> some of the things that that ran afoul of, of uh, long-term interests in the, in the Roman Empire. I would throw into that bucket also the idea, and of course, all analogies break down. So I don't know if we wanna pursue the analogy between Rome and Washington too far, but uh, it, it's probably also worth mentioning that because of this idea that you get ahead by taking from someone else, yes. uh, at least in part, that was at least in part a motivation for the Romans to Definitely. Uh, try to spread their power around the world. They enslaved millions of people. And so if you conquer enslaved another millions country, of people and doing that in increasingly geographically far flung fashion becomes increasingly expensive yeah. on the margin. And the cost that went into that was enormous. And for this reason, they had put themselves in a bad fiscal footing as well as, as you point out, uh, bad footing in terms of ethics or democracy. They had made uh, several mistakes uh, in the long run. Now, one might argue that, you know, for their time, they weren't all that stupid, right? Uh, There is a trial and error, I think, that goes into figuring out how government best operates and how economies best operate. And I would argue that in the grand scheme of things, we're relatively young in the process. Yeah. I would be optimistic 
I know you guys talk a lot about uh, America's future. I would be optimistic that at least the world's future, if not America's future, will see a, a greater dose of uh, freedom and uh, what we call capitalism, the ability of individuals to make economic decisions in the context of freedom, taking greater root around the world and us doing a better job of economic development and cultural development as we learn how to hold our governments accountable, hold them smaller in scale and scope. Uh, but these ideas, I think, are in the grand uh, scheme of the span of human history, relatively young. Yeah, One might argue that we've made a lot of progress in the last 200 years, as much as we're upset uh, today about wanting things to go better. What's so your Mike, if I on may, that, please. If, if I may, I'd like to uh, say that. that's really important. This is Dave Hamilton, and I co-host with uh, Roger, but, um, uh, and it's great to have you here. This idea that we seem to be very unhappy with the state of our world and our country at a time when we are all living better, enjoying a better uh, standard of living and relatively more freedom than we ever have in our lives, uh, in the history of the world, and yet we seem to be almost uh, despondent uh, about it and, and, and we're hypercritical. So, you know, uh, unmet expectations, that's the root, the cause of, uh, of unhappiness, right? So if your expectations are utopia, you're probably going to be a little unhappy, okay? So I'm really interested by your candidacy, and I'm also interested that the people watching have an understanding of what the Libertarian Party is and what you stand for, because I think there are a lot of people who watch the current discourse, see the two major parties, see them tearing each other apart. And one of the things I say all the time is that partisanship is the single existential threat we face, that if we can't figure out a way to get along together, find common ground, work together, et cetera, and stop attacking each other. And it's interesting to me that the Libertarian Party may provide some opportunity there, right? Um, that, that that there is a bridge. That, and, and if you would, give people under your view of where the Libertarian Party fits in, how it's relatively the same and or different than the other two parties, and what we need to do in order as a nation to find common ground and improve progress and, uh, and, and the lives for all of our people in the future. I appreciate that. There's there's not much to unpack there either. You guys do load a lot into a <laughs> couple of sentences, don't you? I love that. Um, let me start out by saying two things real quick. Number one is I think we have a huge opportunity as a libertarian party and more broadly libertarianism in 2024 and beyond for a lot of really horrible reasons. You know, what we what we just discussed about the direction of authoritarianism in the United States, which, of course, plays into our wheelhouse politically, but also uh, at a more uh, strategic or even more tactical level. You have to admit that a lot of Republicans are frustrated with their leadership and a lot of Democrats are frustrated with their leadership objectively for good reason. Um, you know, just the idea that Donald Trump and Joe Biden would be uh, the leaders of these respective parties. It looks like today, uh, a year from now, we may eat a lot of those words. Right. Um, but looking at it from today's perspective, I think that it would be hard to argue then in the grand uh, scheme of things, those are the two guys you would expect to be leading these parties if you, you know, woke up after being asleep the past 10 years. Uh, so having said that, I do think that there's not just an opportunity, but an obligation in some sense for libertarians to step up to the plate and play a major role in American politics in the sense that we are, philosophically speaking, the descendants of the people that put together this nation and our constitution in particular, and did so for the purpose of protecting individual liberties and giving people a way uh, to work together in what I might sweepingly call freedom. I don't think uh, it would be easy to argue that the United States came into existence for a lot of other reasons uh, I think that that's number one. People people did not come across the Atlantic Ocean in those days uh, without a, a, a pretty motivating <laughs> constitution, lowercase c, in their belly. And, and for this reason, I think that we need to recognize that the Constitution, capital C, was put together for these reasons. And it is the loss of that governing structure 
that it really presents a lot of problems for us today. I would argue that we live in a post-constitutional nation in some sense. Uh, however you feel about certain decisions made by the Supreme Court over the last couple of uh, de- well, over the last couple of generations, however you feel about uh, politics more gr- at a more granular level, I think it would be difficult to argue in, in, in a big picture sense that we are anywhere near as adherent to the Constitution as we used to be. And I don't think the average American really feels you know, somehow emotionally bound to the Constitution. And I think this is a a source, one of the sources of our problems. And so I think that it's important that uh, libertarians step up to the plate. We are the party that represents the idea that your government must be limited in scale and scope, that the Constitution represents a style of government of delimited powers, not just limiting the government, but suggesting that this is what you're allowed to do as a government and no further. It's the Libertarian Party that stands up for the idea that whatever power you do allow government needs to be as decentralized as possible, which is a fairly American concept, not solely American, but uh, a a, a very, I would would suggest a very American concept, that as much power as as possible needs to be reserved to the states and even more granularly down to the local level as possible. Um, School boards, for example, need to be the ones to involve parents in deciding curricula instead of most most recently, instead of Tallahassee to be particular, right? As, As much as anyone might, I don't know why I'm picking on this particular example, but as much as anyone might like Governor DeSantis because he sort of seems like a limited government kind of guy, um, he's not completely, but you know, if he ruffles feathers in that direction, good for him. But you you have to say that that that's not really enough. Uh, it's not really enough that we would, you know, that some people might agree with him on what directions he wants to give to a school board. Uh, it's just as important that you allow school boards to make those decisions for themselves. This is one just a little example to to try to illustrate that point. And I think that Americans are generally, I'm interested in your feedback on this, actually. I think that Americans generally are more aware today than ever before that a lot of our problems come from bad public policy. Our economy, for example, doesn't look all that different than it did in the 1970s and 80s. But in those days, we weren't so skeptical about democratic institutions economic institutions involved with the government. I I, I would not argue that that's our fault, by the way, that we've lost a lot of faith in these institutions. I would argue that a lot of these institutions have done these things to themselves in terms of casting away the the good faith that we had instilled, that we had projected onto uh, uh, so many of them. I think that they have left us more than we have left them. And I'm not arguing that that's a good thing, that we all have lost faith in these institutions. Uh, You know, I I don't mean to suggest that I'm an anarchist. I might be a minarchist in the sense that I want government to be as small as practically uh, possible. But to the extent to which we agree, and we can all have an argument about it, what kind of government we should have, how small can you get it? We might agree or disagree on certain things. I think you've got to agree that we need fund fairly fundamental reform at this point of many of our institutions, that it's institutional level reform. We need not just replacing one politician with another at this point. We've, we've tried a lot of jockeying around different types of leaders. And yet some of these institutions continue to make the same sorts of mistakes over and over again. I would throw in that bucket institutions like the federal reserve system like the FBI, uh, institutions that maybe we would all agree are well-motivated, that we all used to root for. I mean, heck, I still root for these institutions, and I think that they need to be replaced completely, right? They just seem unable to live up to the mandates that, that, that we give to them. And so I worry, uh, this is a long-winded, I apologize, answer to your question, 
I worry about America's future in the sense that both ethically in terms of authoritarianism, as well as in terms of foreign policy, which we can get to, and fiscally in terms of how long we can stay afloat financially, I think in both regards, the government that we have today is doomed. Agreed. Unless fundamental changes are made, I don't see this government making it to the end of the century, for example, uh, anywhere near it without some pretty fundamental uh, reforms. And I'm interested in your feedback on that idea. Yeah. Why I'd like to speak to that really quick because Richard made the point earlier, and I think it's, he makes this point from time to time. These values, some of this thinking has become, to use the term, cringeworthy. The notion of uh, caring about the Constitution, these values, et cetera, the rule of law, um, this sort of thing, uh, just understanding what the Constitution and the word freedom is, to your point, uh, less valued than it was 10 or 20, 30 years ago. And um, at, most people more, care more about outcomes. I want this result, and I want you to give me that result however you have to do it, without regard to, oh, was it constitutional? Um, is this ethical, et cetera? And, and you see that a lot with the uh, Supreme Court results, right? Yes, right. So, and 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 few people realize or weren't rec uh, weren't educated well enough to understand that the Supreme Court's job is simply to determine whether something is constitutional or not, not that whether it's good or bad. And every time a law is judged, you know, you see a ruling or a dissent saying, "Oh, this was good or this was bad," you say, "Why are you discussing that? That's not your purview." Your job as a Supreme Court justice is tell us, does it adhere to or not adhere to the Constitution? But That's right. Pe people forget that and they want to forget that. What they want is what they want when they want it in the way they want it. And structure, rules, rule of law, process, be damned. And this is going to go along. I think you put your finger on it. OK, so this is an attitude issue. OK, so there's an old saying, which is everyone's a libertarian in a crisis. Have you heard this phrase before? Oh, yeah. OK. And the idea is in when, if there's a crisis, I don't care about um, red tape and bureaucracy and regulations. You know, if we're going down a, a river and we're about to hit a rock and we can go left or right, we're not going to send it to committee. There's one right? caveat, we're, though. We're going to we're going to figure that out in war. Whereas, authoritarian. Uh, yeah. Now, 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 in, now, today, though, this doesn't really apply. People now say never waste a crisis because it's an opportunity to grab power. Okay. That said, I worry, and you worry about America's future, future um, uh, Rudyard does too. It seems to me that there's going to have to be some sort of revival. I don't even call it that. Some fundamental reassessment of these principles, et cetera, and maybe a reawakening or remembering that America was the great uh, experiment. It's not the old fogey guys. It, we're the new guys on the block, as you pointed out, only a couple hundred years old, and that we're the weirdo revolutionary um, extremists that came up with a brand new way. And everyone else today in America seems to want to go back to some sort of feudal system and let the government be in charge. I'd like you and, and Rudyard to speak to that. It. Um, well, go ahead, Rudyard. Oh, thank you. I, uh, I'm, I'm a, a, there's a couple of things I want to bring up. One is that in each major civilization, one ruling class seizes power, and then they hijack that entire society for their benefit. In India, it was, it was the priests. In Rome, it was the slave owners. In China, it was the bureaucracy. And America, in the Western world in general, used to have a very fluid social structure. So it was comp competing between the businessmen, between the government, between the church, and because of that, the West could advance technologically, do all this crazy stuff because there was no ruling class to stop it. But since World War II, we've seen the rise of managers in both corporations and the government. And the managers, it's why everything's through a process now. And the managers try to create processes to abdicate responsibility. And that's the biggest problem I see with freedom, that People are scared. They abdicate responsibility to a bureaucracy, whether it's a corporate bureaucracy or a government bureaucracy. And my biggest worry for freedom is that we've abdicated raising children to a bureaucracy and the bureaucracy raises the children to love the bureaucracy forever. And I don't know if you see, saw the stat or the Cato Institute, but I'm 22. A third of people my age want 
to have cameras in houses to see the, the people there isn't abuse in the government. A third of Gen Z literally wants to have telescreens from 1984. And that's this, the biggest problem I have with wokeness and that whole sentiment is I support rights for LGBT people, ethnic minorities, women, but it screams at one thing. It screams incredibly loudly, tells you to focus on that thing, and then completely abdicates responsibility on absolutely everything else. It is why I no longer characterize the Democratic Party as socially liberal. Yeah, they're 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 like religious fundamentalists. <laughs> uh, in some ways, they are. Uh, I mean, consider the difference between the Libertarian Party and the Democratic Party. The Libertarian Party, we argue like cats and dogs internally metaphorically punch each other in the face and then go have beers in the democratic party you damn well better toe the line you know if uh if you get out of line as far as uh, the values that you profess the policy prescriptions that you support you will get run out of town on a rail yeah and so in that sense they are what we you know, a generation ago would have characterized as conservative, you know, in, in the sense that they well, do want bullies to anyway, right? a certain, what's that? Thought bullies anyway. Well, yeah, thought police in, in, in the sense that, uh, you know, they want to preserve some set of values and impose them on everybody else. And I think that that's the common thread behind your observation that so many people are okay with the 1984 style. By the way, for your viewers, we're talking about the novel 1984, not the year 1984. Uh, so many of your viewers would support the government peering into your living room and at the same time uh, support the idea of certain groups living by their own standards. Uh, you know, if, if you're a group in the... Uh, category that the Democratic Party wants to protect these days, then you're all good. But if if you're not, uh, or if uh, you give rise to some reason why a Democrat should worry that you're actually thinking differently than someone in one of the protected groups, then, you know, maybe you need a, a, a two-way television screen in, in your living room so we can make sure that that you hold fast to the to the principles that the Democratic Party believes in. So uh, I would worry about that very much. And that's what I mean by, uh, I don't think that the federal government of the United States is on an ethical path that is in the long run sustainable. You know, you're right that we're the new kid on the block. Uh, relative to other styles of government, we're not necessarily the new kid on the block in the in the more limited context of democracy modern democracies right uh the democracies that we see around the world are post 1776 whereas the non-democracies date back to uh the dawn of tribalism so it, it depends on on how you cut it and for this reason i can't help getting the feeling that not only is the libertarian party obliged to try to get us back to the constitution to try to, try to get back to some values that I would characterize as as American and democratic. But I also think America has an obligation to the rest of the world. Maybe obligation isn't quite the right word, but has a has a role in trying to demonstrate to the world that this can work. And uh, what I fear is that the role that we will play in the long run is to show what doesn't work. Yes. You know how you can you can get uh, half of the solution, but if you miss the other half, you you could easily be doomed. And and you know maybe as much as I may lament that as an American, maybe for the sake of humanity in the long run, uh over the course of thousands of years, that's a valuable lesson that that the United States government needs to teach everybody don't do what we're doing. So I worry about that. <laughs> I also worry that that the federal government will go fiscally bankrupt. Yeah, scary. And yeah, that um, we're, we're becoming that people Greece. like us won't care. Yeah, to your point, we're becoming Greece as a percentage of our GDP. 
We are spending more and more and having more and more debt relative to our percent of GDP. We're not to where Greece was when it collapsed and Europe had to bail them out, but we're getting there. And that's because the Roman leaders are giving bread to the masses and that's how they get elected and stay in power. Pandering is causing us to be uh, to keep to run up the credit card. And to even bring that up makes you kind of a, a, a crazy tin pot nut job. Oh, you fiscal response. Yeah. Well, I have to do that at home with my own credit card. Okay. All, all, all that being true. Um, so, and I thought to your point, I don't want to interrupt you, but to, 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 to piggyback to your point, I thought Greece was going to teach the world as much as I felt bad for the Greeks. Well, and, and for the rest of Europe for having to bail them out as, as badly as I felt about the whole thing, I thought the silver lining would be the world will learn its lesson. The, it learned yeah. the lesson that Germany will bail you out. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's the lesson. And it that's the that's the downside to the lesson is that you can withstand this crash. Yeah. So, in full disclosure, I consider myself a classic liberal. I grew up le very much left of center all my life, over forty years in the Democratic Party. I consider myself now an independent, a radical moderate, if there is such a thing, right? It's sort of an oxymoron, okay? And um, I'm just concerned. And one of the reasons I, I, I call myself that is that I believe wholeheartedly we have to have an opportunity for people to disagree, to, like you said, punch each other in the face and then go have a beer. We have a, a podcast coming out with somebody who is, I would consider, significantly more right of me. He's, he's a good guy, great guy. His name's Kurt, and that's about to come out. And he's a fascinating guy, brilliant. And we don't agree on everything. We, we don't. And and even and Rudyard doesn't agree with him on everything, but he's fascinating and he's interesting and he has some very thought provoking points and he and he's right about a lot of stuff. Okay, but afterwards we're going to go have a beer, we're going to yeah. disagree, et cetera, and then that this episode is going to show we're going to get a, some really interesting comments, right? And some people are going to probably uh, uh, try to cancel me or Rudyard or whatever for having had him on, right? And it's amazing to me the comments that Rudyard gets. He's been doing this for nine years now. And he gets everything from being a right wing nut job to a communist. Let me read them out. I sent some to Dave. Um, They're stunning. Yeah, he's totally right. <laughs> I Depending get called on, a fascist you know, and a communist. I get called uh, an atheist and a Christian fundamentalist. It's hilarious. <laughs> and this is because if you don't take on the total um, gospel, right, the, a full doctrine of whatever the position is, then you're a contrarian and therefore you must be on the other side because you didn't agree 100% with their point of view. What I think a fundamental problem here is we've mixed religion and politics too much. Bingo, because, bingo. Yeah. And, because we're not religious, then uh, our politics becomes our religion. And the thing I, I despise is we, people get stuck on points that they really shouldn't. Like, for example, we had a guest... When Dave got me for this podcast, he had a previous co-host, and I think immigration is nuanced. There are certain points where it makes sense, other points where it doesn't. You have to view it almost like a board game and do it on a case-by-case -case basis. And I said we should have had immigration until around 2000 and cut it off then. But um, the, the, the co-host didn't want to have any nuance on the immigration discussion, because if you were against immigration under any circumstances – that made you a horrible person. And the thing that I, there's people put the sacred into political things that are often incredibly nuanced and that destroys them. Well, the, you just can't have this degree of shaming in politics. And once you shame someone for making a decision, you can't have a real discussion and your population doesn't really deserve democracy anymore because people think, people look back at the loss of democracy over time. They'll think, oh, isn't it so sad they lost democracy? But when a population loses its democracy, it's because it fundamentally wasn't responsible enough to keep it. Because if you're, there has to be responsibility somewhere in the political structure. And if you put the average person, tell them you have to think clearly, you have to deal with your fellow man, then it doesn't end up in a ruler. But the reason communism always becomes despotisms is the entire population says, oh yeah, let's just work things out and share and care. And that doesn't make sense. So it automatically goes to the tyrant. So real well, quick, you're 100% wanna... right. I'm reminded that when I was growing up, there was this uh, idea that the First Amendment was something that you virtually worshipped. Yeah. 
I worshiped it. Absolutely. I'm much younger than you. And that was still a sentiment when I was growing up. It's nuts that like when I was 10, people still talked about freedom and the first amendment and how great that is. And now people don't really care. It's not that they turned against them, but the first amendment and second amendment, they based, they large parts did, but it's more that they, it's a magician's game where the magician makes you focus on one hand that he can rob you with the other. Well, and to so David's I, point, it dovetails with his point that people care about the outcome more than the process. Yeah. And I think that it dovetails with that, that people care more about whether or not you agree with them than your right to say something stupid. You know, I, I can remember so clearly, and I don't think that my parents were all that different from most other parents. Uh, you know, they were classically uh, liberal and they were educated and and I was very lucky, but I don't think they were that different when uh, growing up outside of Chicago, I can distinctly remember, although I can't remember what years, so maybe someone in your audience will bail me out here, when there was, um, a relatively infamous Nazi march through Skokie, which was a highly uh, Jewish community. David's nodding his head. Maybe he even remembers what year. I was there. And it was You're such a teachable. It was such a teachable <laughs> moment, not merely in my household, which of course it was, but I remember it being a teachable moment throughout the community that we were so proud. Uh, that's a weird word to be able to apply in this situation. But that's what I remember as a kid. I remember thinking we were really proud of the fact that we would tolerate, you know, these buffoons marching in a way that was absolutely intended to irritate the residents. Right. I mean, it, you could barely imagine a more horrific application of, of free speech. And, and yet we were, weirdly uh proud of the fact that we lived in a the place ACL, where the aclu came out them. in defense of this march and stood up for them being giving them the chance to speak it was the aclu and the anti-defamation league at yeah. that time that cared more change. about the first amendment well it, it was a different age can you imagine the aclu doing that now i'm not sure that they would because there's a lot of free speech that the aclu has uh, given up on and I think that that's a real loss uh, for our democracy, not to get yeah. overly dramatic about it, but I think it is a loss, speaking of institutions that have drifted away from us as opposed to us uh, from them. And I'm reminded that we, we say this all the time, I'm not breaking new ground here, that, that the First Amendment really has no meaning without an unpopular opinion. You know, if, if you don't have someone willing to say something really dumb by the standards of most Americans, even if it's not dumb per se, but if, you know, you, you have to have someone willing to say something that's unpopular and a real threat that the government might do something about that. That combination is what is required to test the First Amendment and to make the First Amendment have real meaning. And for this reason, I was kind of hopeful this will probably tell you how dumb I am, right? I was kind of hopeful that the recent Supreme Court decision backing up uh, this uh, woman's uh, right to, to web, not the create web the, the website, right, Creative 303, to not create the website uh, for the particular wedding. It was, as I understand it, a, a gay wedding that she refused to make a website for even though she was willing to uh, build a website for generic purposes for them. And I was kind of hopeful that people would uh, come to some sort of understanding as to why this decision was made the way it was, and it would be in some sense a teachable moment. And of course, in, in large part, maybe there's small pockets of silver lining out there, but in large part, it's just served to make us more divided. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it did not have the effect that I was hoping for. Were, were you similarly disappointed or were you just smarter than I was? So I think I mentioned that I was a follower of Alinsky in our conversations before. This, yes. was, an, this was an Alinsky-esque effort to put someone on the spot and force them to deny service in order to gain the limelight. The people who brought the suit knew that they could get someone else to develop a website for them. 
And as a matter of fact, pornography exists in large part because of the First Amendment, freedom of expression, et cetera, right? Okay. Right. So you can get any kind of website you want made. There is some there is there is a marketplace of people who will build any website you want. They intentionally chose even libertarian presidential candidates. Okay. Yeah, you, know, you they might even build a website for you as horrific as that idea might be, right? But so this person knew that they could get the website done, but they chose this group to put them on record and in order to cause a conflict. Saul Alinsky did the same thing many years ago. In South Chicago, he went and said, hey, um, why don't we have a um, medical facility, a free clinic in this area, knowing that if he applied, he would get the money. He went to a government agency, screamed and yelled at the lady behind the counter with a TV crew. And, and when she said, hey, sir, fill out the form, you can have the money. Before she could get that out, he was screaming at the other. He says, yes or no? One question, will you or will you not give us this money for this uh, the free clinic? And she said, yes. And then he threw up his hands in, in victory and said, see, I won. This was a completely staged Alinsky-esque uh, tactic, and it works. Okay? So... So if you get into the nuance of this whole case, right, there's, it's like an onion. There are many layers to this website yeah. case that we're talking about here, right? Yeah. Okay. If you then ask a fundamental uh, Muslim to build that website, okay, they didn't. If you really want to play this game, you want to play hardball, go find a really hardcore uh ISIS, no, I, I'm just saying not that far, but you know, a, a really hardcore um, uh, fundamentalist, a, yep. a fundamentalist Muslim, and ask them to build you a gay website. I mean, they don't. Yeah, do good luck with that. Fatwa. What's that? They do yeah. get a fatwa for gay. Be a fatwa. No one wants to. No one wants to to fight off a bunch of terrorists. People don't so mess with the Muslims because the Muslims mess with you. This was an unnecessary thing in my mind in that there is a marketplace. These people are not, the folks are not being underserved. You can get a website. Of this, course. This fight this, this this was picked. Of course it was. And, and I thought that it would, you know, nicely backfire and that we would, you know, get a teachable moment out of it. As I often uh, point out, speaking of fundamentalists, uh, I was raised by a Lutheran and a Calvinist. You really don't want to ask, you know, how does my family feel about the way you should live your life? Because they'll, they'll tell you, okay? They will tell and, and bless their hearts. Uh, and I'm not arguing that they're wrong, right? It's how I was raised and look how great I am. But however you may feel about that, as a libertarian, I think that I need to personally work very hard to the extent to which I participate in public policy discussions. I need to work hard at not sharing those opinions. It shouldn't matter, right? Uh, my personal opinion, much less my family's personal opinion about how you should live your life should be completely irrelevant. But the basic point is, do you really want a government that can force you or anybody else to do or not do something? So th this example is important. Um, there is no public policy that bans anyone from creating a website for someone of a different sexual orientation. Okay. That's right. And that's where the conversation should stop. The pronoun discussion made Jordan Peterson famous, not because yeah. he was a racist, sexist, homophobic, whatever. It was because he said, I will call you whatever pronoun you want me to call you if you're polite to me, but you can't matter as a matter of law as a matter of public policy, put me in prison because, or find me because I won't use somebody's preferred Which pronoun. Leads and good for him for it. saying so. He did risk losing his job over it, uh, but at least it, it did launch a, a an odd career on, on that point. And he became and, a conservative in the mind's eye of everyone, and he considers himself to be a classic liberal. I, I would agree with that assessment, and I think it speaks to how far left uh, the Canadian uh, government and Canadian population, perhaps, had shifted over the years. I don't know that he was so far right as much as his uh, brethren had moved to the left. Yeah, he he was anti-government control, and that made him, in their mind, a tittle the hun, right of a tittle the hun. It's um, yeah. this leads me to two interesting points. One of which is that there's been this large political shift where David keeps on calling me a centrist and everyone over the age of 40 calls me a centrist. For everyone under 40, they just assume I'm conservative. 
because the yeah. Overton window switched that far. And among guys my age, if you're not woke, you're just branded a conservative. And you see those people like Russell Brand or uh, Tim Pool, who are Joe right. If they were there, they'd be progressive if you looked at on the political compass. But the thing that horrifies me because I check up on a bunch of things the news doesn't cover, and I'm always shocked the news doesn't look at them, is in how every area of the West you're seeing horrifying collapses of freedom. The Dutch farmers, Germany with um, Germany pushing environmentalist policies they can't really back up, so they go back to coal. In Scotland, in parts of in Canada, and a bunch New Zealand, and a bunch of other places. They've literally made progressive talking points hate speech that you can go to jail for being against. New Zealand's just bans tobacco when California wanted to ban tobacco. New York City is trying to ban wood-fired pizzas for climate reasons. And it like it shocks me that now having grown up in Chicago, I actually have no problem with that. New York pizza sucks, but keep going. <laughs> no, but Amen. the thing is, these are things that if they happened 10 years ago, would be completely taboo. But now in every major area. They would be jokes. They would be late night yeah. talk show host jokes. You're right. But New York City banning pizza for climate reasons. You look at that. What percent of of climate problem of CO2 emissions is wood fired pizza? It's 0.00001%. Ban the private jets first. And it's it's remarkable that we with the way the internet works, we're always looking at we don't have any focus. And the scary thing is all of this happens. And my mom's Canadian. No one really bats an eye up there. They've become so docile that their government can break every freedom and because no one there's cares. no context. None of these issues are viewed in context in the bigger picture. You can yeah. pick any issue, focus, drill in on it and make it good or bad or evil or awful. And also based off based on how you phrase it, right? So the wood fire pizza thing, not only do you, would you compare it against um, uh, private jets as, as as their contribution to you know, the carbon footprint. But how about to the next um, uh, volcano that goes off? All of this in together, and I have a geology degree. I founded the Small Wind and Solar Institute. I have a design for a vertical axis wind turbine. I'm a, a climate guy. I, I value the climate. I value it, et cetera, right? I value a, a small wind and solar, but I'm not stupid enough to think that they don't have issue, that there aren't problems with these things, right? This is the problem that all, all of these conversations end up being centered around uh, 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 hyper focus on one little thing. No context is is kept. Um, and so today, recently, one of the ideas I proposed 30 years ago is in vogue now, which is finding ways to redirect, to increase the Earth's albedo, how to have more reflection, how to block the sun. That has just come out again. That's not a new idea, by the way. It's an old idea. All right. Now, the big question is you have to prove to me that we really need it. Before you start blocking the sun, can we have definitive proof that this is a valuable thing to do, that we're not maybe entering into a cold period, which we could, right? Which we could be. And which by the be, way, never know. And, right? and by the way, uh, you don't want to find out the hard way about implementation errors that turn into unexpected side effects. Thank you. Because the earth has had five or six major um, uh, extinction events, and two of them, the earth um, froze solid. Right. So, and up until now, they've not been man-made, but we're still working on it. None of them have been man-made before, right? I exactly. Look, I think that you're you're really on to something. The, the climate change debate, however you feel about it, is something that really sends shivers up my spine because of the enormity of it and because of how easily science became politicized over the last generation, to your point, right? And that worries me having watched us go through the COVID regime, right? Because while as a libertarian, I I would have thought, uh, I would have thought ex ante that the lesson that we would have learned would be, gee, be careful about how much power you give to the government. They might make some really dumb decisions. And for all too many Americans and lots of people around the world, arguably proportionally more people around the world than even in the United States, ex post, it looks like the lesson that was learned was the government has figured out that it can control us perhaps more easily than they had even expected and that they have ratcheted up their expectation of an ability to control us. 
And by the way, controlling the science, not controlling the science per se, but the communication the around the, the science, science. Yeah. yeah, is the way to go. That for relatively short periods of time, like a couple of years, you can pull the wool over the eyes of a lot of people. Now, I'm not suggesting that I even disagree with anyone in particular about the science. All I'm suggesting is that our federal government took it upon themselves to decide what is it that you needed to be aware of and what you didn't need to be aware of, what you should focus on, to whom you should listen, just as importantly, to whom you should not listen. And whether or not you're allowed to speak or not. I thought this was uh, a tremendously profound set of lessons for us that really worries me in the context of, of future crises, because as you correctly point out, there, there will be future crises. And I'm afraid that those are going to be uh, large, even by the scale of, of our COVID fears. When I look and, at Mike, I, I want you to know that I made essentially the points that you're making in social media posts, and I was lambasted and punished. Run out on a rail. Yeah, he I was, was literally, and, his account and, and was literally shut down. Who is, what's that, sir? Yeah, Dave was was literally censored by LinkedIn. Yeah. So um, I'm vaccinated. I believe in vaccines. My family is vaccinated. But as someone who understands science, I know that no vaccine is perfect. And I didn't expect it to be perfect to begin with. And when I chafed at the idea that people would say, oh, this is 100 percent. I mean, I reminded people that there were some that didn't trust it because it came out under the Trump administration and that they had selective memory for that. I, I, Joe I, Biden said he wouldn't trust it because it came out of the Trump administration. And Kamala Harris said the same thing. And then I remember Trump famously chiding um, him saying, hey, I guess the sh shot didn't hurt so bad. Way to get your shot, Joe. Way to take one for the team. I mean, all that. Um, I recall being told that uh, we should be able to go back to the subways and congregate during Chinese New Year's. Right. At the very beginning of COVID. That That's we were right. That's right. To do it. I remember all of those things. The problem is I have a memory. A lot of us have a memory. We remember the things that people said. And we say, wait a minute, for all of you who were hysterically vain and, and condescending and paternal, uh, paternalistic, et cetera, patronizing, um, that hubris is dangerous. And the next time we have a, another crisis, I hope that we'll be a little more gentle with each other. And that if someone dares to ask a question about the science, that we won't say that they're anti-science. Well, I agree with you 100 percent. The other th thing that uh, that that I spend a lot of time talking about inside the Libertarian Party is that as a matter of uh, politics, as a matter of public policy. We need to be careful about talking about science at all. I don't mind to the extent to which the government uh, has information. I certainly don't mind the government distributing it. I do worry about the government being the authority and in control yeah. of that information because it's naturally it gets uh, politicized maybe naturally is not quite right. the right word but uh eventually uh and virtually inevitably it gets uh politicized so one of the things I, I spend a lot of time talking about inside the libertarian party is the difference between how we feel about the vaccines and how we feel about vaccine mandates because that's where it really touches public policy and so i often make the point Speaking of being unpopular, uh, just just trying to share your your pain. Mm -hmm. um, I often make the point that if you had a perfect vaccine, which is to say, uh, imagine that if you didn't get the vaccine, you're going to die 100 percent. You don't have a chance. If you do get the vaccine, you're going to live 100 percent. No worries. And there are no side effects and that we have perfect information all about this. OK. Perfect vaccine, perfect information, perfectly trustworthy. It's obviously a, a, a mental exercise. Please mm -hmm. don't uh, suppose there is such a thing. The question is, for a libertarian, would the government have the right to force you to take it? Well, it, it, no. And the answer, the answer has no. got to be, from a libertarian point of view, it's no. no. If we have the Black Death, I'd make an exception, where if the Black Death is... I'm actually thinking about that because we know, have our young friend on the phone. Your, your point, Mike, was that as a libertarian, the answer is no. I'm not telling you I might stop being a libertarian that moment. If I believe solemnly 
that people not taking this vaccine would 100% cause the death of all mankind, I might hold you down and jab your arm. I might. Uh, I get that. I, I, I do. I totally, But totally as a libertarian, I couldn't. If I was to hold to my um, beliefs, my, my, my values as a libertarian, I couldn't do that. Yeah. But, but then again, if I thought you were going to kill my kid, I'd shoot you. That kind of, you know. You know that, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I totally get that. And by the way, I respect that. Yeah. And also, I'm going to be honest about it, too. I'm not going to lie about it, et cetera. No, 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 no. <laughs> As you're holding me down and giving me the jab, I'm going to say, you know, I hate your guts, but I totally and respect you punch where you're me, coming and, from. You know, and, yeah. I, um, I like to say modernity is a combination of the autistic masculine and the hysterical feminine. And you can choose to look at modernity's response. Is this autistic or is this hysterical? And the most beautiful things are like COVID, where it's both, where it has this very rigid mental structure, it refuses to leave, refuses to see any nuance. And then you throw hysteria on top of it. The war on terror is another example where it's the combination of this very rigid mental worldview that allows no nuance with hysteria on top of it. And with all these topics, it leads me back to people my age, where I think there's among Gen Z, there's this giant split between basically zombies and people who are very active. And it's a lot of young people my age. They don't, their parents never let them play outside and they were always scheduled doing violin recital. They go to a, like a bureaucratic lifeless school. They then go into a workforce that's the exact same thing. And so you have an entire group of young people that have not, John Heitrock talks about this in the coddling of the American mind, who have basically had no agency in their lives. And because of that, they um, basically support for government in every aspect of life because they're, because that's what they understand. And they're scared of, like, I know loads of young people that are scared to have phone calls. They're scared to go on road trips. They're scared to speak out for themselves. They've lost all mental agency, basically. But also on the other group, you have a very active demographic that have realized that the world's really rough and you need to stand up if you you need to stand up and act for yourself if you want something. I think that's a big potential libertarian or libertarian adjacent group. And whether or not you like him as a person, Andrew Tate's massive popularity among young men kind of signals that. Where Andrew Tate is philosophically a very libertarian figure. And among young men, I've seen a mass exodus from the left to basically whatever's not the left, because you have absolutely no incentive to be to be a left winger as a young man. So I'm hopeful that the libertarian movement, party, philosophy provides an alternative to what could be an ugly version. And I think I think of Andrew Tate as somewhat ugly. OK, uh, there are certain things that I might agree with him on, et cetera, but he's pretty caustic, polarizing, negative, et cetera. Right. So um, this angst that his generation is experiencing can metastasize into something in a more Andrew Tate's uh, vein and uh, an outlet, an opportunity to be engaged and to feel like you have agency, that you can get something done, that you matter. It seems to me that the Libertarian Party provides an opportunity for that segment to to actually join and be part of something as opposed to really tune out, not be a zombie, you know, zombie there. I can't tell you the number of young people. My, my 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 two sons. They they go. I don't want to hear this stuff, Dad. I just really don't. You go. Well, I think we all get that, and 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 uh, you know, it's it's not just the youngsters. You know, people of all ages are are frustrated and tuning out and and turning off. And as we spoke uh, much much earlier, part of that is because the parties themselves stink. A couple of things that we haven't spent much time talking about, and and I don't know that we need to, but just to throw them on the heat, maybe for your future podcast. One of the things I worry about is the extent to which Americans get their news from trusted sources. News from right. trusted sources from from trusted sources, and the extent to which it's not only reinforcing, which is its own problem, but the extent to which it's exclusionary and leverages fear of the other yeah. and fear of people who don't agree with us and therefore drive wedges, not merely as a byproduct, but as a part of the shtick, right? So I, I worry about that driving us apart in the future. I do believe, and, and, and by the way, I agree with you on the Andrew Tate thing. Uh, yeah, his popularity is a lesson for us. And at the same time, David, I think you're right 
that it is uh, an, an uncomfortable and unattractive version of what things might morph into. This is one of the reasons why I think it's so important that as libertarians, that people like myself, and by the way, Americans who still profess to believe in tolerance more generally, I think it's very important for us to leave our druthers about the culture war out of our discussions of, of public policy. And I recognize that American politics are the intersection of these two things. So that's, you know, what I'm suggesting is not easy. But, you know, you guys mentioned earlier on that part of our problem is the downfall of religion. I don't think those are the words that you used. But politics Same is, thing, yeah, in no small part. Uh, it's a replacement for religion. A it's replacement. Not, just the absence of religion because people yeah. want meaning and purpose. I think that that is very, very true. And that we need to be able to say, uh, by the way, this is not easily achieved. Uh, sometimes uh, I give people reason to accuse me of suggesting that some of these things are easy. And to the extent to which I do that, I have misspoken. But we do need to find a way to say your cultural values are important. We're not trying to say that they're not. We're not trying to say that they're wrong. You do you. And by the way, not merely you do you in a libertarian, I don't care sense, but you do you because it is important. Yes. Uh, you do you because cultural values do matter. The way you raise your family, the way that you pass on values from one generation to another, the way that you respect what has come before you, and the way that you lay groundwork for the future of your own life, of your family, of your descendants, of your community, of your nation, that does matter. You know, we're not trying to say that it doesn't. But that is different than public policy. Public policy in the United States, and the reason that we've been successful, I believe, is because we believe in a public policy that allows you to do that, not that yes. forces you to do that. And we need to get maybe better at making that that point. One yeah, of so the advantages- I've run a speaker series, just real quick, Roger. You know, the America's Future Series thing that we run says that we are a rapidly nonpartisan and that we care about policy, not politics which is your point. You yeah. can get people to agree and to like each other and to get along if you focus on policies. If you pick a particular policy and you unpack that and say, what about this? What about that? Can we come to a reasonable agreement? Can we create a scheme on this, You know, say for immigration or whatever? If you're not allowed to say I'm right and you're left or you're right and I'm wrong and you're wrong, whatever, if we do not affiliate with a party, I can put almost any two people in a room together and say, can we come to an accommodation on this policy? Yeah. And your, your focus on policy really matters to me because I do believe it is tribalism that is going to end us, right? And we have to find a way to talk about policy without making it political. Well, I agree with you wholeheartedly. One of the, the if I can be just self-serving here for a moment, I'm in the job of being self-serving. Uh, so if I can just give myself uh, 20 seconds. Not here. in office though, I'm hoping. What's that? You're not going to be self-serving in office, I hope. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. As a matter of fact, I will remain uh, Lutheran and Calvinist only in the background. You not self-serving once you get elected, right? <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, my self-serving attitude is going to begin and end on your show. What I mean <laughs> is that the, the reason I'm running the campaign style that I am is that I do believe that a policy forward campaign is important both as an ethical matter. So one thing I want to add. Would... What's that? Yeah. One one thing that I I should add is that the reason I believe that the style of campaign that we are running is the one that makes the most sense is both a an, an ethical matter. We believe that we need to lead with a very policy forward campaign to spread the idea of libertarianism but also as a strategic matter in the sense that I do believe that a policy forward campaign is what will most effectively differentiate us from Republicans and Democrats. I do believe that most Americans are looking for a third choice or at least a different choice. And I believe that most Americans have a libertarian streak. I think most Americans recognize that a lot of our problems are bad public policy, but also uh, the result of our parties uh, not doing a very good job of representing individual interests. One thing I say to people all the time, 
and and you'll you'll recognize this being the opposite of a common refrain about people feeling like they're wasting their vote on a third party. One thing I always say is stop wasting your vote. You should vote for your ethics. You should vote for your principles. Well said. You know, to the extent to which you believe in our constitution, you believe in a pluralistic democracy, to the extent to which rising authoritarianism drives you crazy, to the extent to which you miss the simple dignity of being represented by a foreign policy that reflects your values, to the extent to which you wish there was a modicum of fiscal conservatism that means that your federal government might have a fighting chance of lasting another generation, then you should vote libertarian. Stop wasting your vote. Now, so I'm I support an autocracy you. that gets involved in permanent wars and does not have a functioning government. Uh, I also support it being based entirely off discrimination towards every single group. So Mike, Mike, um, I, I knew Ross Perot <laughs> here when he was alive. He hosted, wow, he uh, I'm a little jealous. He was an interesting character. He was a fantastic person. Uh, he hosted several of our events. We honored him with our five-star award. He was the first person we honored with that for extraordinary support of our military. As you know, he ran for president, right? Um, you know, United We Stand was his book, et cetera. And he was the probably the most successful third-party candidate we've had in, say, 100 years, right? Right. More successful than uh, John Anderson, who was uh, a, 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 a relatively successful uh third wheel right and and he was sort of the poster child for what's a, a radical centrism um it, it, that whole movement okay so um, and a populist yeah and, and a populist and great sucking sound will, will you listen can, can i talk i got a chart i gotta show you right um I, 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 he caught me doing that one time he walked up behind me when i was doing my imitation of him one time it's pretty funny oh that is awesome he busted by the me. way um, uh i worked for the white house in 1991 92 and worked for George Herbert Walker Bush's uh, re-election campaign in in 92, when I still thought I was a Republican and I still thought the president was a Republican, too. Well, maybe when you thought the Republican was more, Republicans were more libertarian, maybe that's when that was. When, when, when they were don't, when they... don't bring up bad memories, David, make <laughs> your point. <laughs> so he had billions, founder of EDS, Pro Systems, et cetera, a true self-made man. You know, yep. love the guy. Um, he had a bully pulpit. Right. Um, uh, and some would say he did some harm. He he divided the vote, et cetera, and he determined the outcome and he didn't win. I will say simply this, whether a libertarian wins or not, the value there for for watching uh, uh, Ross do what he did was he changed the discourse. Yeah, he changed the focus. It was the first time you heard anybody talking about fiscal responsibility in a meaningful way. Right. Yeah. He was against the sucking sound of jobs leaving our country, whether it was yep. next to NAFTA or now China. Right. Okay. Um, so I have to commend you and your pursuit. And I, I I would like to support, I'm one of these people, I'd like to support the libertarian movement. I appreciate that. Okay. Now, how, 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 how does money have, as a former operative of the sort of left end machine, right, of the Alinskyites, and I can cite all the rules for radicals, right? I go, eh, it just doesn't look strong for us here, guys. We need billions and we need maybe, and sometimes you need a, you're, you're being a nice guy. The other side is a polarizing people who will say anything about anybody and, 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 and stare you straight in the eye and gaslight the hell out of them because yeah. all they care about is winning. Well, I care about winning too. Uh, I believe that winning might look different than a Republican or a Democrat thinks that winning looks like, and not merely because I'm willing to settle for fewer votes, because to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I, I recognize that for us, a home run is a third, right? 37% wins. I suppose technically you could conceivably well, win with less than 34%, but 37% wins. And we're not going after everybody. So I do believe that a fully differentiated message will give us a shot. I think that most people like the idea of an underdog in addition to liking the idea of a third choice, uh, in addition to liking libertarianism. And I do believe that not only our style of campaign, which is to say very much policy forward and very differentiated uh, and very much based on ethics and principles, I think that our campaign being backed up by credibility uh, we make sure that we back up our our ideas. Our platform is very fairly uh, transformational, but we do back it up 
with some real world experience. I personally, our candidate uh, has two careers in public policy. And I think that for that reason, a lot of people are going to give us a look that wouldn't normally give us a look. I think that there are a certain number of donors, folks in media, uh, as well as a, a large number of voters who will give us a look because we can check a few boxes that a lot of libertarians have not been able to check of late, which is to say a background in public service, a background in public policy, uh, a lot of credibility, in addition to a very transformational platform. So I'm optimistic. Well, um, if people want to support your campaign, learn more about you, at first, how do they contact you? How do they find you? That's important. And um, uh, well, let's do that first. How, how do people contact you or find out more about your campaign? The easiest way, you can go to our website. You can go to uh, either one of two websites. The platform is at goldnewdeal.org. Don't go to goldnewdeal.com because they'll try to sell you something, Some which is not necessarily a bad idea, but it's a, good. It's the it's the wrong website. So you can go to goldnewdeal.org because that's the name of our platform. Uh, we have uh, uh, achieved a, a, a separate branding for our platform as well as its own URL, because it's sort of our commitment to the idea that we can't back down from our very transformational platform. Or you can go to MikeTremont.com. Uh, the problem with that is you'd have to spell it right, which might make a, a bit of a challenge. Okay, you're Dutch. Yeah, I'm Dutch, and uh, Tremont has two A's in it. So you'd have to go M-I-K-E-T-E-R-M-A-A-T.com. And there you'll see uh, our platform. Uh, something about the candidate, something about the campaign. We're very proud of our team, by the way. We have a very professional team in place. And for your listeners out there that have uh, a few extra bucks that are, you know, very annoying to them and they need to get rid of them, they can do that uh, on the website because you know that money is so cumbersome. Yeah, you got a lot of those. None of this stuff comes for free. Uh, and uh, perhaps even more importantly, uh, we like to work with volunteers. We have a lot of people that want to play a role uh, with our campaign, whether it's making phone calls or technical things. Uh, there's always a lot to do with the campaign. So folks that want to get involved and you'll find my personal contact information there. So if you want to give me a call, you should probably text me first because otherwise I won't know who the heck you are and I might not answer. But my real phone number is there. My real email address is there. So if somebody wants to reach out and uh, tell me that I'm all messed up and wants to correct me and argue about it, we can do that. Uh, or if you just uh, have some questions, we can field those as well. Well, I want to echo just how uh, or focus on how special that is, that how approachable, how uh, reachable you are is fantastic. But also, uh, let's not I think people need to understand that you have a background that is not just in public policy, not just in public service as a police officer, but you had a career in business before that. You have a, mm -hmm. a financial background, which far too few um, politicians have, right? You're not a career politician, right? You're no. more of the uh, original revolutionary founding father's notion of someone who has had, had a career and then chose to serve. Uh, that may be, although not in farming. I'm, I'm no John <laughs> Adams, uh, but... Uh, yes, my but first career. They didn't was... envision people that would make a, a 50 year career out of being in politics. Right? <laughs> uh, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, I, a buddy of mine and I did run our own business. We had a, a business in strategic consulting and educating financial services professionals, which was, as anyone who's ever done anything entrepreneurial knows, is a lot of fun and a lot of hard work at the same time. And I worked as an advocate for free markets inside the financial services industry. Uh, in Washington for a, a lot of years after leaving the uh, the government. And as you might imagine, that was very educational too. And I have taught economics at a couple of three different universities. And I worked for the public school system part-time as a substitute teacher for a couple of years, which is a very uh, strangely educational experience, as you might imagine. Sobering, actually. I did it too. Uh, uh, yeah, as well. Just, it, it I, can I be I sobering. To, I found it to be too hard. I when just couldn't do it after, in, after a little like, bit of subbing. <laughs> it's amazingly difficult. I did walk away with an enormous amount of respect. Uh, being a police officer will, will it, it'll do a couple of things to you. 
Uh, one is that if you weren't an economist before, it'll turn you into an economist because you see the result of bad public policy up close and personal. Everything mm-hmm. from bad housing and zoning to the war on drugs, creating black markets and bad schools, undermining families and careers and all of that. But the other thing that you see as a police officer is that unions are not typically, at least certainly not uniformly, in your interest. Yeah, I'm from and I, feel, I, I continue me. to feel bad for, for teachers in this regard, too. I was surprised, to your point, by how hard so many teachers work. Uh, absolutely amazing. You know, I was there as a substitute off and on, you know, for like I say, over a year, you know, one day a week, sometimes, sometimes three days a week. And I remember when uh, a young woman uh, was teaching math and she went out uh, for maternity leave. And all of a sudden I was sort of the teacher, you know, and they told you, you're going to be here for a couple of months. And I thought, well, you know, the past few days haven't been bad. How hard could this be? And all of a sudden you had to deal with not only creating lesson plans because she hadn't left me two months worth, but in addition to to that, you had to work with the parents, of course, which I'll admit was wonderful uh, to to work with families that that care and to try to get favorable outcomes for the kids. It's all good. But anyone who thinks that working as a teacher is a light assignment hasn't done it. It's uh, it is a lift. And I have every respect for those with the calling to do it. But I do believe restructuring is important and teachers would be better off on the other side of a robust school choice program, their unions notwithstanding. Well said. Economics 101, uh, I think, applies. Hey, can we at least close the bottom 10 percent? <laughs> if they yeah, were a business, do... they would fail, right? Well, you're exactly right. I don't think it's a coincidence that this is uh, arguably the most protected industry in the United States, and it is the one with which we are most frustrated. Uh, It would be hard to argue that schools operate effectively or efficiently or at a high level by comparison to either schools outside the United States, schools inside the United States that are in the private sector, or by the standards of other industries in the United States. Uh, nobody no says, says no one in India says I want my child to go to K through 12 in Oklahoma, in Texas or wherever they don't. And I'm from Oklahoma and Texas. They yeah. they don't say they want to go to our schools, our, our colleges, excuse me, our universities where there is some semblance of competition. Our universities are the envy of the world and the local public schools are the bane of our existence. And it's a, a real shame. I, I might even go so far as to argue that it's our number one policy problem in the United States, notwithstanding everything we talked about. And that's not to diminish our fiscal doom and our unethical foreign policy, all of which is terribly uh, uh, important and problematic. But the idea that we uh, effectively force families into public school systems that in so many cases stink is not only unethical, uh, but really problematic for our cultural development, it's a, it's our a, economic I think development. It also, it's an issue in U.S. global competitiveness. We're, we're not able to compete. I went to 11 schools by the time I got to the 10th grade. My mother was a school teacher. I, I've seen all kinds of schools, et cetera, moved a bunch of times, et cetera. Good, bad, and indifferent. Um, our school system was broken then in the 60s and 70s. And, and it hasn't gotten better. And it hasn't gotten any better. I think it and also- it's not the teachers. It also just sucks the life out of kids where, for example, I have 5 million viewers on YouTube and I do, a, I know a lot of young men get their basis in history from watching my YouTube channel. And if you can explain history well, they'll suck up every detail and learn to love the subject. But kids who get fed history through the public school system, they're not going to remember anything. They're going to end up hating the subject. And It's like we try to force feed kids and there's no feedback with who they are as individuals, just put them on the supply chain. I don't think it's a coincidence that like a hundred years ago, the level of debate for presidential debates was at a college level. Now it's at a fifth grade level. Uh, I I definitely think you're onto something. It's a structural problem with our parties, but it's also a problem with the level at which, you know, kids grow up expecting to hear a debate 
and their ability to understand it yeah. in a detailed way. So for all these reasons, it's a it's a huge problem. And then when you layer on top of that, the goodies in the entitlement programs, it's darn hard to resist. Yeah. Okay. With all of that said, Mike, um, I want to say uh, thank you for being on our program and for your uh, campaign. Um, thank you. You're an entrepreneur, which is no small task. You have to be brave to do that. I'm not. I've been an entrepreneur, but I have no, uh, no uh, uh, idea that I would ever be as brave as you are. So to run for the highest office in the land, given what politics looks like and the slings and arrows that people have to go through. So I want to. I'll tip my hat and salute you for doing that, and also for being a voice of reason. Uh, well, David, you're awfully kind, but I will say up until now, you haven't wanted to serve as a politician. Up until now, you haven't wanted to run for president, but um, it's only uh, seven o'clock where I am and the day is young. Uh, but I'm not. And I spent 30 years in the civil rights movement, so uh, I'm done. We'll, we'll see about that. I'll, uh, I'll call you in a while. I'll call you next year. <laughs> this is as close as I'm going to get for a while. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so you, much. Your... It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's absolutely been my pleasure, my joy. It's been uh, a lot of fun. You guys are terrific. You have a terrific program. Thanks a lot. Sure thing. Take care.